We've been fighting a long time, and we have all lost so very much, so many loved ones gone. But you are not alone. There are pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. You have no idea how important you are. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. Hey, welcome everybody. It's Steve with Fidelity. I'm coming at you with the ninth episode in this series on socialism with Michael Graney. Thank you as always. Oh, it's good to be here. Yes, yes. Uh, we hear there. We sometimes Michael pops on the premiere comments we've heard. So if anybody's watching, uh, be on the lookout. You might see Michael pop on. Comment well, and say hi. Go up from now on, I don't think I got other things to do, like prepare for the next show. Yes, <laughs> which this one is going to be on the wolves in sheep's clothing, Fabian Society. Yes, a lot of people today don't realize the influence that the Fabian Society has had, or even what their goals are. And yet, if you look at their emblem, what you want to do? Google Fabian Society images. And one of the things you'll see is their badge or their coat of arms, whatever they want to call it. And it is the wolf in sheep's clothing. Their goal, as they tell people, is to infiltrate organizations and shift them to socialism. That's it's what they do. They make they don't hide it. They may hide their methods. They may call their socialism something else, but they make no bones about the fact that what they're doing is they're infiltrating under the guise of something else. They're going in under false colors and they brag about it. It's like so many people, for example, wonder why did Hitler, you know, why did, why did the Western powers not know what Hitler was doing? Well, they did. All you had to do was read Mein Kampf. He told you exactly what he was gonna do. And by golly, he did it. One thing Hitler did was keep his word. Wish he hadn't. And all, all the Western powers are saying, gee, we didn't really think you'd do it. We yeah. got a lot of that. A lot of people tell us what they're doing. We're like, ah, no, nah, that's just whatever. Yeah. And then, oh. it's wild. <laughs> we can't believe it. Well, you can believe the Fabian Society because they've managed to do in large measure what they set out to do. I'm not impugning their honesty. They've said what they were going to do, and they did it. And they told you what their methods are, and they carried them out. They are not hypocrites. Now, from the position of someone in the, in the Catholic Church or any other Christian body and in some political bodies, well, yes, you're, you're undermining what we stood for. But they can honestly say, but we told you we were going to do it. We didn't make any secret of it. Now, as a result, because people don't seem to believe what they're told and won't believe their eyes, says the Fabian Society has been one of the most effective proponents of the new things, you know, socialism, modernism, and new age. Uh, they have implemented the goal of Henri de Saint-Simon, I think I pronounced that correctly for a change, uh, to revise traditional Chris Christianity to uplift society. They have a definite view of society and what it should be, and it comes straight out of the new things of the early 19th century. They want to establish the kingdom of God on earth. Now, whether they call it that, that is the general term that, for instance, uh, Dr. Julian Stulbe has pointed out. It's a virtual obsession with the adherence of the new things. They may call it something slightly different, but it's always some variation of establishing the perfect life on earth. Now, the, the scientific socialists, such as the communists, may ridicule what they call the utopian or religious socialists, but they have the same goal. What they're doing is they're just going at it at different ways. And of course, the, what St. Simon wanted to do was establish the new Christianity. You know, the Catholic Church and other, you know, traditional Christian bodies, they may have been good in their day, but their day was passed by the end of the 18th century, long past in some, in, in the opinion of many socialists. And so the, the goal of all of society 
and this is the way St. Simon put it, is that the whole of society ought to strive toward the amelioration of the moral and physical existence of the poorest class. Society ought to organize itself in the best way adapt in the way best adapted for attaining this end. Uh, that's pretty much the message of his book, The New Christianity, which was published after his death in 1825. Now to return to the Fabian Society, the society itself is an offshoot of the Fellowship of the New Life. Uh, this was founded in 1883 as part of the Greater New Life Movement, which was one of the movements within the whole socialist movement of the 19th century, which was vast. I mean, when you see you know, the popes from Gregory the 16th on condemning socialism and modernism, they weren't just picking on a few people. They were viewing what they saw as a danger to the whole of society. Now, obviously, the sincere socialists and modernists don't think that they're the danger to society. They think they're they are the solution. I personally happen to disagree, which is one of the reasons for this series, and a reason that I hope you <laughs> that you're watching it. Now, uh, the, the 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 fellowship of the new life lasted only from 1883 to 1898, but they did have a lasting influence. Uh, primarily in the fact that members also formed the Fabian Society a year later. Uh, the fellowship itself claimed to have been inspired by reading Emerson and Thoreau, you know, Ralph Waldo Emerson and uh, <clears throat> Henry David Thoreau. That's what they claim. I'm not sure if you read Thoreau and Emerson that you would find anything much resembling what the Fellowship of the New Life promoted, in their writings, but that is what they claim. Of course, many socialists claim to find what they're doing in the teachings of Jesus. Jesus was the first socialist. So just because someone claims someone as an inspiration and a source, take it for what it's worth. I mean, that may they may be honest in their conviction that that's what these two people said or not. Uh, the idea of the fellowship, of course, was to, they, they, they sought the cult, and this is a quote, the cultivation of a perfect character in each and all, At, end of quote. And the way to do this was through pacifism, vegetarianism, and simple living. Basically, the small is beautiful way. Uh, some of the notable uh, people who founded the, the, the fellowship, and they were explicitly socialist. Uh, they made the claim that Christianity and socialism are said to be convertible terms. And that too is, is a quote. In other words, if it's Christian, it must be socialist. If it's socialist, it must be Christian. I, as I said, I don't doubt their honesty. I just don't agree with their premises. Uh, the fellowship members did want to use the power of the state to transform Christianity and society and create what you know, many of the socialists called the kingdom of God on earth. If I keep returning to that, it's because they keep returning to it. Uh, the member, the, the founder of the, of the society, let's see if I can read this, was Thomas Davidson, he was the founder. Uh, some of the others were, uh, now I'm gonna use labels to describe them. I got them from the Wikipedia. I did not research them to find out if this is what they called themselves or what they meant by it. I'm just repeating it. If you want to know about what they were talking about by these labels, you'll have to do your own investigation. I, I was trying to get to the Fabian Society. I didn't want to spend too much time on the, the, the fellowship of the new life. Uh, Havelock Ellis, who called himself a sexologist. I don't know what that means. Uh, Henry Stephen Salt, who was for animal rights. Uh, Edith Ellis, who was a feminist, uh, and Edward Carpenter, who, and I questioned this label, but it was the label that was used, says gay rights. I don't know what that means in the context because, frankly, that's a new term. So who knows? Maybe he was just wanting to stop per persecution of homosexuals, which is perfectly legitimate. Or maybe he was pushing for uh, other things. I don't know. Uh, as I said, 
That's just a label, take it for what it's worth. Uh, now, the Fabian Society was founded as the political arm of the Fellowship of the New Life uh, on January 4th, 1884. The fellowship was founded in 1883 and they quickly realized that they wanted a special organization to carry on. Uh, it's specifically political goals. And the Fabian Society itself was inspired by the enthusiasm of its co-founders, Edward Reynolds Pease and Frank Podmore. I have to insert a bad joke. I always get those two confused. They are like two peas and a Podmore. So <laughs> sorry, I had to do that. Uh, <laughs> we'll be here all week, ladies and gents. <laughs> I, I give in to my lower self occasionally. Uh, and what inspired them to form a specifically political arm was the, their, their shared enthusiasm for the theories of Henry George. Uh, you knew he was going to pop up again. Now, there's a new drinking game on Henry George every time you hear him. <laughs> <laughs> but seeing as how, you know, you have to be a teetotaler, what you're drinking is another matter. Now, and this is a quote from the history of the Fabian Society, which was written by Edward Pease. I've read it a couple of times, and I get most of my information about the Fabian Society from their own history. It's what they said that I'm repeating. And this quote, and I forget what page it's on, but who cares? Uh, you can get the, a copy of the book yourself. Uh, to George belongs the extraordinary merit of recognizing the right way of social salvation. George believed that the majority desired to seek their own well-being, and this could not fail to be also the well-being of the community as a whole. Which sounds pretty good until you realize that what you're doing is you're mixing up individuals and the collective and assuming that they have the same identity, which is not true. The collective is a human construct made by people for people, whereas the human person was made by God for God. And it continues, from Henry George, I think it may be taken that the early Fabians learned to associate the new gospel with the old political method. In other words, use the state, you know, the mechanism of the state, you know, the democratic method, the vote to infiltrate and then convert the state to the new gospel of socialism and thereby gain your end. They took the name Fabian Society from Fabius Cunctator, Fabius the Delayer from the Second Punic War. I don't know how much classical uh, education most people have. I'm actually writing a book about this, so I know. <laughs> Uh, I know probably a little bit more detail on it than most people. Uh, the way Fabius decided that he could best beat Hannibal, and he turned out to be right on Italian home ground, was avoid battle, fall back, make, Fab make Hannibal waste his resources chasing Fabius all over Italy. And it was only when they, the Romans decided that they wanted some action, they got rid of Fabius, put in somebody else, and had one of the worst military disasters in Roman history. But that's another story. Now, members of the Fabian society itself drifted between democratic, religious, and utopian socialism and scientific socialism. Uh, in the history of the Fabian society, it expressed admiration for Marx, but they said, although we tried that, we didn't think it was right for us. Uh, they didn't criticize Marx's theories. They criticized his presumed methods of violent overthrow. I'm not sure that Marx really advocated violent overthrow. There's been a lot of research recently into whether a lot of Marx's stuff actually came from Engels, but we don't need to get into that. Uh, well, as I said, we won't get into that. I have to stop myself from digressions at this point. Now, the some of the notable members, early members of the Fabian Society were Annie Bizant. Now, she was interesting. She was Madame Blavatsky's chosen successor. Uh, Chesterton called, uh, what, what, what did he call her? I, I, I think he called her a witch and Blavatsky, an amiable old fraud. So, but 
I, I forget which one of his essays he said that in. Uh, then there was Richard Orridge, who ended up editing New Age magazine. And Arthur Penty, who was considered one of the founders of Guild Socialism, or the founder, depending on which source, I found three different people taking credit for uh, Guild Socialism, uh, which we'll get into in a minute. Uh, actually, a few minutes. Uh, then there were Sidney Webb and Beatrice Webb, who ended up getting ennobled, becoming aristocrats for their socialist work. In other words, to infiltrate the government and overthrow it and institute socialism, the British made them Lord and Lady Passmore or some such thing. I think it was Passmore. I, I can't find it here. <laughs> some of my notes get a little bit scribbled on, so sometimes I can't read them myself. I, I typed them originally and then scribble all over them to clarify to myself, and I end up not being able to read them. Now, Richard Orridge said that the socialist movement at this time was a cult mixing, this is a quote, Theosophy, arts and crafts, vegetarianism, and the simple life. This simple life theme keeps repeating over and over. And, <clears throat> excuse me, according to George Bernard Shaw, who was probably the, one of the most famous early Fabians, uh, he said that the greatest strength of the Fabians was that no one knew what they were doing. No one could figure out. And he, this was in an interview in the Boston Evening Transcript in 1908. And he was saying, you know, of course, how, sometimes I don't know whether to believe what George Bernard Shaw said or not. He had an active imagination and sometimes he saw only what he wanted to see. And he was a little bit dishonest in how he argued too. And he was sometimes more concerned with being clever than getting a, the real point across. Uh, so what he said was that the Fabian's greatest strength is that Nobody outside could figure what, out what they were doing, but, and assuming he excluded himself and other members of the inner circle of the Fabians, he said the problem with the Fabian society is that the members couldn't figure out what they were doing. As I said, he was probably being clever, but confusion apparently over what socialism is and should be and was and is, is a, is a baffled even the socialists which actually calls to mind what Alexis de Tocqueville said he observed during the, the socialist revolutions of 1848 in Paris. He said there were thousands of people in the street, all pushing different programs, but all coming under the common name of socialism. He says, nobody knew what they were doing. Uh, in fact, I think, should I bring, it was Chesterton again. Uh, George Bernard Shaw liked to tell Chesterton that when he was a socialist, he didn't know what socialism was. And when he wasn't a socialist, he didn't know what socialism was. Well, then, I, if I were Chesterton, I would have said, well, then why do you keep pestering me to be a socialist? Since I don't even know what it is. Anyway, there have been a number of influential uh, Fabian socialists, Fabians. Uh, and most people are actually surprised to find out that they were Fabian socialists. Uh, possibly the most influential was Richard Henry Tawney, R.H. Tawney. Uh, and these, these are quotes from the biographies of him that I read. Uh, he was considered, quote, the most influential theorist and exponent of socialism in Britain in the 20th century, end quote. He was also called, quote, the democratic socialist par excellence. He served on the Fabian executive, you know, the, the group that governed the Fabian society or tried to run it, if you can, it was probably like herding cats. Uh, he served on the Fabian executive from 1920 to 1933, at which time he had a fight with the webs over whether socialist control should be at the national level or at the local level. He wanted a quasi medieval uh, pseudo communitarian type of control, but the, the Webs wanted national and ultimately international control by, by a socialist organization. And they came, came to a parting of the ways on that one. Now, he is 
Tawny is probably most famous for two of the books he wrote, which is The Acquisitive Society, which came out in 1920, and Religion and the Rise of Capitalism, which came out in 1926. The Acquisitive Society uh, has been called by some fellow named Richard Howard Stafford Crossman. There's a, there's a mouthful for you. He, he was a socialist. Uh, he called it, he called the Acquisitive Society the Socialist Bible. Have you ever noticed how when everybody wants to give something authority, they call it the fill-in-the-blank Bible? I think my older brother had the Shooter's Bible. Then you have the Gardener's Bible, the Everything Bible. I got the Whiskey Bible right here. <laughs> the which? I got the Whiskey Bible right here. And, of course, the first entry is Irish whiskey. <laughs> which is not made from potatoes. That's a dirty lie. It's made from grain, the same as all other whiskey, for heaven's sake. Uh, vodka's made from potatoes. Everybody needed to know that, right? <laughs> uh, That's why they tune in. That's why they're here. <laughs> let's, turn out, let's find out what a low life I really am. Let's see. <clears throat> low life leading the high life there. The Miller, oh, I guess I should mention specific products if they even make it anymore. I don't know. Uh, but in the Acquisitive Society, Tawney revised the traditional understanding of private property. Uh, he claimed that property itself encourages acquisitiveness, hence the Acquisitive Society. All ownership equals capitalism. In other words, in other words private property itself is capitalism. I mean, aside from the fact that Marx himself defined capitalism as concentrated private ownership of capital, not ownership itself. Believe it or not, if you've read the, the, the Communist Manifesto written in 1848 and read it carefully, Marx is not against private property. What he's against is concentrated private property in the, you know, concentrated private ownership of capital. Because if you read it, it says, Private property, you know, that people have acquired by their own hard work and labor. Why that we are for that. What we're against is this property that the capitalists have stolen by theft of surplus value and all this other stuff. He says, we don't we don't talk about the hard, you know, the, the private property of the worker. That has already been stolen and abolished by the capitalist. So Tawny was actually doing Marx one step better by saying that all property is evil. All private property is bad. It's all capitalism, not just concentrated ownership. So, and in the Acquisitive Society, he improvised history to support this contention and to support the socialist viewpoint. Uh, according to Tawney in the Acquisitive Society, the popes and the Catholic church were absolutely corrupt. The, the church was engaged in suppressing the true message of Jesus. And this is, of course, is another constant theme you'll find throughout the early socialists. You know, 100 years before Tawny was writing, they were saying that, oh, the traditional churches have suppressed the message of Jesus. Jesus was the first socialist. All you have to do is read the Bible. Well, wasn't the Bible written by these people that you consider corrupt? Or as C.S. Lewis pointed out, the Bible is a book written by believers for believers. The only thing you can really prove from the Bible is that something's in the Bible. If you don't believe it, why believe it? You can't use it as an argument against believers because the believer, <laughs> believers wrote it. And if you want to find out what the Bible really means, ask someone who actually believes the Bible. Now you can have discussions about what it means, but if you're using the Bible as an argument against Christianity, I don't think that's going to work very well. Now, uh, this quote, and I, as I said, I, I don't like to give extended quotes, but in this case, I think it's, it's useful. This is from the Acquisitive Society. When the Reformation made the church a department of the secular government, it undermined the already enfeebled spiritual forces which had erected that sublime but too much elaborated synthesis. In other words, the church itself was a construct not founded by Jesus, but by people for human purposes. 
nor was it inconvenient for the new statecraft to see the weight of a traditional religious sanction added to its own concern in the subordination of all classes and interests to the common end. In other words, we're going to change religion for political purposes, since it's already been done, according to Tony. The center toward which they converged, formerly a church possessing some of the characteristics of a state, he's meaning the Catholic Church during the Middle Ages and the late classical period, was now a state that had clothed itself with many of the attributes of a church. In other words, combination of church and state, which of course was precisely what Tawny wanted, except his way, not somebody else's way. And then came this comment, what was Christian in Christianity had largely disappeared. He is speaking of what the Reformation did in changing the Catholic Church. He was saying, well, the Catholic Church wasn't Christian anyway. And this was on the, in the 1948 edition that I have of the Acquisitive Society, pages 10 to 12, if you're interested. Just in case somebody th thinks I made that up. Now, Tawny's magnum opus, however, came out in 1926. And we'll find out, in my opinion, in the next episode, which concerns G.K. Chesterton and the Fabians, uh, the timing of these books. I, I think I have enough evidence to support my argument, but we'll save that for the next for the next show. And I just came to the end of that page of notes. <clears throat> you can tell I'm an amateur at this, or I'd have you know like the like what do they call it? the teleprompter going there giving me my, my notes here. Hey, you slid in a nice teaser for next week. <laughs> yeah. Hey, gotta bring them back. After all, we're making so much money off of this, aren't we? That's a... <laughs> no. I live with mold. If anybody asks. <laughs> Oh, you're a cheesemaker. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we knew you were doing something on the side there. Anyway, Tawny's magnum opus came out in 1926, Religion and the Rise of Capitalism. Now, what always baffled me is that I know of people who claim to have converted to Catholicism after reading Religion and the Rise of Capitalism and other works by Tawny. And I can't figure it out because all he does in both books is bash the Catholic Church, except for the Fraticelli, who are his heroes. In the Acquisitive Society, he called them the only true Christians. Why? Because they wanted to abolish property, which was what uh, Chesterton would raise in Saint, his book on St. Francis of Assisi. The Fraticelli Actually, the, the Fraticelli were a splinter group of the spirituals, but it's come to be a, a generic term for all the spiritual Franciscans who were basically renegades who kind of overinterpreted St. Francis's thought and basically turned it into an anti-social, anti-property, anti-everything sect. In other words, all you have to do is abolish property, abolish government, abolish all these other things, and we will return to the Garden of Eden. Uh-huh, whatever you say. And they were so pacifist that they were willing to kill people in order to be pacifist. What was it uh, Chesterton said, the French pacifist whose first thought was the way to bring about peace is to kill all the warmongers. Uh, now, in Religion and the Rise of Capitalism, Tawny's theme was that the organized churches had departed from the real message of Jesus. Here it is again. The, the socialists are always bringing this up. The modernists, you know, we have to return to the true message of Jesus. Well, isn't that what the church is supposedly teaching us? Oh, no, 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 the church is corrupt. The popes are corrupt. The princes of the church are all corrupt. Only I know the true meaning of what Jesus said, the true message. And I and they get it straight from the Bible, which was put together by the church which is allegedly corrupt by the time they said the Bible was put together. <clears throat> right. Now, Tawny, and these are his words, says the religion must change and become less religious. He used that word. Religion must become less religious and more naturalistic. Now, I'm not sure what he meant by naturalistic. I'm not even sure what he meant by religious. But he said that what the world needs is, quote, 
a change in the conception held of the nature and functions of a church. Well, I always figured that a church, meaning an organized religion, whether it's a, a synagogue, a temple, a mosque, or whatever, is to assist you in preparing for whatever God has intended for you. You know, your, your, your end in life, the, as in end of life, the meaning of it, not just to keep life as an end in itself. The whole idea behind organized religion is that life has meaning. It is not just an, a mere end in itself. And I don't know of any organized religion that would argue with that position. Maybe there is one. I mean, even the Church of Satan is trying to prepare you, I assume, for whatever it is your final end is. In other words, life is not merely an end in itself. Now, according to Tawny, of course, and this is reiterated in Religion and the Rise of Capitalism, the Fraticelli were, of course, the only true Christians. Uh, they worked to restore, quote, the primitive austerity and the return to evangelical poverty preached by St. Francis, but abandoned by many of his followers. This is, of course, a reference to the split between the conventuals and the spirituals and of one of the spiritual sects, the Fraticelli, uh, who split over their interpretation of the rule that St. Francis drew up. And what they, getting into a little theology here, what the spirituals did was confuse a council of perfection with a mandatory way of life. And what they did was completely misunderstand what Jesus told the rich young man who came to him and said, what must I do to gain eternal life? Or what is, or, and Jesus said, keep the commandments. Now, Jesus answered the question, but then he said, the young man, and depending on which gospel you're reading, it's because he wanted to justify himself or because he just wanted to find out, well, you know, what more can I do? He said, I have kept these from my youth. What more can I do? Now, if what followed was absolutely necessary for salvation, Jesus lied. Now, if you tell me that Jesus lied, I'm going to call you a liar. What Jesus said was, what more do you want to do? Go and sell all you have, come and follow me. Now, if that was absolutely mandatory, Jesus didn't tell the truth in, when he answered the question the first time. So when the spirituals said that everyone must give up pri must give up property, we must all live in this evangelical poverty, as mandatory, they were not following what Jesus himself said. They were following their interpretation of what St. Francis of Assisi said, which may have been a little distorted. Now, to continue that, <clears throat> that thought, says, this is where he, Tawny again builds up the Fraticelli, the spirituals, as the ideal, the only true Christians and this is a quote directly from Religion and the Rise of Capitalism. I have the 1952 edition. This is on pages 56 to 57, in case anyone's interested. Actually, I think you can get used copies of that particular edition. It's all over the place. I think it cost me about a buck and a half. The persecution of the spiritual Franciscans who dared, in defiance of the bull of John the 22nd, to maintain St. Francis's rule as to evangelical poverty suggests that doctrines impugning the sanctity of wealth resembled too closely the teaching of Christ to be acceptable to the princes of the Christian church. In other words, the princes of the church, the Pope, were all corrupt because they opposed what the Fraticelli were doing, insisting that we must abolish private property. Actually, Chesterton takes it one step further and says, they were just wanting to abolish private property, they wanted to abolish all property. Everyone should just live and be given what they need because they need it. We must base everything on love. And if you don't go along with it, they're gonna hate you. Now, that was pretty much the message of R.H. Tawney. The Catholic Church and all the other traditional Christian bodies are absolutely corrupt because they've departed from the true message of Jesus who was the first socialist. Uh, 
those are my words. I don't know that Tawney ever said Jesus was the first socialist. Uh, <clears throat> but he definitely seemed to think that St. Francis was uh, a socialist. Now, another influential Fabian that is going to surprise a lot of people uh, is Ernest Friedrich Fritz Schumacher, E.F. Schumacher. Uh, he was a protege of John Maynard Keynes. There are rumors unsubstantiated, no one can find out for certain, that Keynes was himself a Fabian. There are many indications that his economics were fully conf in conformity with what the Fabians were saying. There were a number of other things that suggested that he was a Fabian, but there is no hard evidence to that effect. The uh, early 20th century Fabians used one of his father's te texts in the society. But again, you can't find his membership card or anything on a membership role. I happen to think that he was, but that is a personal opinion. But his protege was E.F. Schumacher. And Schumacher was definitely a Fabian because he wrote one of the Fabian tracts in 1943, Export Policy and Full Employment, the Fabian Research Series number 77. The only people, and this is, I got this from the History of the Fabian Society by Edward Pease himself, the only people permitted to publish Fabian tracts were members of the Fabian inner circle. They made one exception in the 1920s, and it was another member of the Fabian Society whom they permitted to publish a tract as a, as a Fabian tract, and they regretted it. I, I'm not sure why, but apparently he, this member decided that since he had been allowed to publish one tract, he should be able to publish others, and they said, no, we don't like them. So as a matter of policy after that, they said only members of the inner circle are permitted to publish tracts. And George Bernard Shaw published a lot of them. I have a couple of them. They're, they're, they're interesting. I don't agree with them, but they're interesting. Uh, now, what Tawny is most famous for, however, is uh, his book, Small is Beautiful, which came out in 1973. And the year of his death, A Guide for the Perplexed. Now, these are fascinating books. I have a first edition of Small is Beautiful. And what's interesting is on the back, it was marketed as the New Age Guide to Economics. And a lot of people say, oh, this is the, the Catholic program. Well, I've read it a couple of times. I think he mentions a pope once or twice, doesn't really refer to Catholic social teaching explicitly. He mentions a lot of Gandhi. Now, Gandhi was an admirable person in many respects, but he was a socialist. And I don't think he was Catholic, the last I heard. So Small is Beautiful is usually classified under Buddhist economics. Schumacher converted to Catholicism. Uh, why, I don't know, but then I don't know why anybody converts. That's a personal decision. Uh, so rather than speculate as to why Schumacher became a Catholic, when judging by his books, it doesn't seem consistent with Catholic social teaching as I understand it. So do I, do I assume is he converted after he wrote the books? I'm not sure. All, he may have done it before. I, I'm not really interested in him. <laughs> so, but some people are, and they take, and Schumacher's Small is Beautiful is he actually cited in the American Bishop's Pastoral Economic Justice for All. It came out in 1987, but it's socialist. And it was promoted, at, it's classified today under Buddhist economics. Apparently before he died, someone asked, why do you call Small is Beautiful Buddhist economics? And he allegedly responded, because if I called it Catholic economics, no one would read it. Now, that's just a little bit too cutesy and a little bit too pat, so I, I don't know. I can't even verify that he actually said it, although people use that. I, I've seen it related as an anecdote. Now, A Guide for the Perplexed is an interesting book, too. One very noted Catholic 
intellectual whom I will not embarrass by naming, called it a wonderful book. There's a slight problem with it. It violates the first principle of reason by positing that truth changes at different levels of consciousness. So that if you are at a low level of consciousness, like a, like a tree or a bush or something, what's true for you as a tree or a bush is not true for you as an animal, like a dog or a cat. And it's also not true for you as a human being because what is true for human beings is not true for dogs and cats, and it's not true for rocks, and it may not be true for, you know, bushes. I'm, he, I, I forget how many, I think he had four levels of consciousness. And he said, truth can be different at each one, which violates the first principle of reason, which is that, which was declared, by the way, infallibly true in the First Vatican Council. That which is true is as true and is true in the same way as everything else that is true. That is the positive statement of the first principle of reason. It's called the principle of identity or the law of identity. If it's true, it's true. If it's not true, it's not true. Now, being human beings, we can't divide everything into is either true or not true. There is also nonsense. In other words, it's neither true nor false. It doesn't make sense, period. Now, the negative statement of the first principle of reason, first law, yeah, the first principle of reason is called the law of contradiction or the law of non-contradiction, which is nothing can both be and not be at the same time under the same conditions. Therefore, the, the premise of a guide for the perplexed that truth can be different or it can be true and not true at the same time under the same conditions violates the first principle of reason both ways, both positive and negative. Uh, that's your logic lesson for today. <laughs> now, both books are basically Fabian tracks advocating a new religion. Uh, it's the only way to describe it. The fact that some people have found inspiration in it and guidance for their Catholic faith Maybe there is stuff in there. I didn't see it, but I'm not going to judge anybody else there. As, as even uh, the popes have said, there is good even in socialism. If it didn't have good in it, it wouldn't appeal to people. And I think it was Pius XI and Quadra Jason Moano had said, says, of course, there's truth in socialism. We have never denied that. What we're concerned about is the chief error of socialism, which is a theory of society utterly foreign to Christian truth, or actually any other kind of truth. You don't need to say Christian truth. And that is that, you know, from Pius XI's point of view, the human person is sovereign. It is the dignity of the human person, not the dignity of the human collective that is paramount. This is why he spoke of, uh, in Divini Radium Torius, paragraph 29, only man, the human person, and not society in any form, is endowed with reason and a morally free will. That's an exact quote. I memorized it from the English, the official English translation. I don't know how what it is in Latin. <laughs> My Latin is terrible. Uh, now, there were some notable spin-offs from Fabian socialism. Uh, result of quarrels or disagreements or whatever. Uh, I'll only name two of them because there's there's multitudes. Uh, one of the more noted is guild socialism. Now, guild socialism, and remember I said that Arthur Penty is often credited with being the founder, and but then some people say Richard Orridge was the founder. And then there's another gentleman, I forget the name, I think it was Cole, C-O-L-E, I, I don't know. But anyway, that's not, that's not the important part. Uh, guild socialism was basically a repackaged syndicalism. You know, uh, ownership by a small or by, by a guild or a union or something, or the syndic or the syndicate, whatever. Uh, that had unfortunately been given a bad name during from its association and participation of the syndicalists in the Paris Commune of 1871. And if you ever want to read anything extremely violent and horrifying, it's you read about the Paris Commune. And 
because it was right after the siege of Paris. Everything was in bad shape to begin with. And then the communists took over. And the, which meant all the various socialists. And of course, they began fighting among themselves. And they began killing off all the capitalists and the bourgeois and anybody else who got in their way. There are some famous photographs that you really don't want to see because they're really creepy. Uh, it, did you ever see Phantom of the Opera? which is from a, a very bad novel, translated from the French. And it opens up by saying that they found all these bodies in the Paris Opera House that they thought had been left there by, you know, during the commune. Well, it was actually all the murder victims of the Phantom of the Opera, but that, <laughs> but the, the, the Paris commune kind of entered the psyche of, of, of the French people. It was so horrible. Now, the, uh, let's see, did I have any more? Let's see, okay. And the other spinoff, I, I, I lose my place constantly because I have all, all my digressions. The other one was social credit. Now, social credit was a, now I have to, to give a caveat here. The recently, the communist China has come up with something they call social credit, which is something completely different. Do not confuse it with social credit of that. That was a spinoff from the Guild Socialist, which spun off from the Fabian Society. It's something completely different. Don't confuse them. Uh, social credit is similar to, uh, I, I guess the closest to it is, is the universal basic income. Um, the idea was that everybody gets a national dividend calculated from the increase in, in wealth uh, during the year. And to generate purchasing power for this, you print, the government prints up money and gives it out to everyone. And then you also adjust prices and do other things to keep things in line. Uh, the, the idea of money manipulation is similar to Georg Friedrich Knapp's chartalism. Uh, Knapp was a, was a German socialist in the 1880s, and his chartalism was the foundation of John Maynard Keynes' uh, monetary theory, as he explained it in his treatise on money in 1930 and 1931. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I say that, it, in my opinion, it's likely that Keynes was a member of the Fabian Society, because he was using the same monetary theory that they were. And it's also the basis of modern monetary theory, which is another thing that we won't get into today because I disagree with it. <laughs> and to explain why it would take too long. <clears throat> now, social credit was the brainchild of Major Clifford Hugh Douglas. Uh, I discovered yesterday when you know going over my notes with, with a friend, she thought that Major was the guy's name. No, it was a military rank. He served in the war, meaning World War I. Uh, and I just stopped myself from another digression about a film that nobody has ever seen except me, I think. Uh, about a fellow who was named major to in order to advance him in life. Uh, now, Douglas called social credit. Now, this is anecdotal. I have only heard seen it referred to on social credit websites and by social credit people writing about social credit. I have never been able to find the original source where Douglas actually said it. He called it Christianity in action. As I said, social creditors maintain he said that. I have not been able to find the original source. Uh, but what he did say was, <clears throat> and this is from a newsletter called The Social Creditor, which came out in, which was published in Australia in September 1973. It was apparently volume number 53, so it must have been published for over a century, half a century, number six. And it's from an article by J.W.D. Lee, Douglas, the Man and the Vision, from the Social Creditor. Creditor spelled E-R to distinguish it from a debtor, which is spelled O-R. The Fabians and the Guild Socialists repudiated Douglas's proposals, not for the technical reasons which one might suppose, but for the philosophical end toward which they were directed. Excuse me. <laughs> Must be getting on near the end because I'm starting to get, get hoarse here. Now, okay, yes, in fact, I'm on the last page of notes here. You lucky people. <laughs> uh, now, 
that raises the issue, what was the phil philosophical difference? Well, the thing was, Douglas believed it is unnecessary for workers to control directly the industries that employ them. I, I've read his books on social credit, and he said that people who own capital, you know, the machinery and everything, they can retain title. But what the machinery produces belongs to everybody because it is the knowledge that the, built the capital is part of the general heritage of mankind. Therefore, the product of this general heritage embodied in the capital should belong to everybody. But the, the people who built the capital are entitled for their work to a small return, you know, just to justify their putting forth the effort. But they don't own anything else. Of course, who determines how much they're due is, uh, is another matter. You know, the market has no place in this. Uh, but the Fabian Society said, well, no, no, the workers should own. Not, not the private owner, the workers should own, except that they don't own, it's the, the organization that owns, the collective that owns. So the workers own through the collective. Everybody owns because everybody owns, not because you can point to anything that you particularly own. So that uh, instead of, according to Douglas, instead of workers controlling, you know, the production directly, they can control industry indirectly through state manipulation of money. You know, the, the, they called it the national dividend. We would call it the universal basic income. Uh, the manipulation of money, credit, and something called the, I think it was the adjusted price, the, 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 the something price to, to make certain that people got what they should get, you know, if you produced it, you're entitled to a small return, but that people can also afford to purchase it from their, with their dividend that they get from the state by printing up new money. Uh, some very serious problems with that proposal, which a man named Dr. Harold Moulton, who was president of the Brookings Institution from 1928 to 1952, addressed in his book, The Formation of Capital, which I won't give you right now because it's highly technical, but trust me, he did not think much of Douglas's proposal, which also includes something called the A plus B theorem, which depending on who's telling you about it can get very complicated. Uh, but basically it's a form of socialism. And in the history of the Fabian Society by Edward Pease, he said that you know, these differences, you know, they were the ones who left the Fabian Society. They'll be back at any time that they want to go along with whatever we're saying. I mean, very open people, allowing, willing to let anybody become a Fabian as long as you are a socialist of some kind. Now, what's interesting is probably the most notable Fabian was George Bernard Shaw. And what is interesting about him is that he equated Fabian socialism and Stalinist communism. Now, I found this in a newspaper, the Washington Evening Star in the 1931, after Shaw had been to Russia and was the personal guest of Stalin. And he was very impressed with what he saw. And this was also, I believe, the time that he was caught, that Stalin was causing massive famine in Ukraine and killing other, and sending people to the gulags and everything else. But according to George Bernard Shaw, and this is a quote, we had better follow Russia's example as soon as possible. And this is from a, a, an article in the Washington Evening Star, August 3rd, 1931, page B3. Go east, young man, Shaw advises youths. Now, he also said, Stalin is a complete opportunist. This is from a different article, by the way. Uh, in fact, the, article, the name of this article is, it's also from the Washington Evening Star, it's from November, 1931. Shaw's greatness declared vapid. In other words, they were showing, uh, you're praising Stalin when he's doing all these horrible things and you just close your eyes to them. But this is what Shaw said. Stalin is a complete opportunist who by a process of trial and error is molding a new Russia. Communism is a force which will be set up against capitalism. There is nothing left of Bolshevism, collectivism, anarchism or class war. Only communism remains. Under the pressure of practical application, the Soviet government has turned communism into Fabianism. 
but the communists won't take our name, so we must take theirs. Now, we're coming up to the conclusion now because you'd think that after that, no one would vote for a Fabian politician. No one would even listen to the Fabians, but immediately following World War II, you had the great labor landslide election in 1945 in Great Britain. This is, this is our conclusion here as to where all this led. People were, had been told that the Fabians were going to infiltrate the government and turn everything socialist. You had George Bernard Shaw trumpeting in the newspapers, Stalin is a great man. You know, the, the Russian system is perfect for us. We must adopt it or go under. So in 1945, the Fabians basically took over the post-war British government. They won 229 out of 640 seats in parliament. That's around 36%, I think. And they formed a coalition with the, with the outgoing government, which had been headed by Winston Churchill. And the new prime minister was Clement Attlee. Now, what I found interesting was that in, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in 1953, out of complete disgust for the Fabian government, Evelyn Waugh wrote a short novella called Love Among the Ruins, showing where th all this was going. And of course, what I find interesting is that Love Among the Ruins is, in my opinion, Waugh's version of Robert Hugh Benson's, uh, you know, apocalyptic novel, Lord of the World, except where, and, and Waugh greatly admired Benson and thought he was one of the best writers he had ever known, particularly for his satire that nobody seems to appreciate. Well, Waugh didn't hide his satire. If you've ever read Love Among the Ruins, see if you could find a copy with Waugh's own illustrations. They are crazy. They're all done in the classical style. I, I think that the title page says something with illustrations done by the author in the classical style. And if you're familiar with some of these old uh, paintings and statuary, the, the titles that Wall put on them are absolutely hilarious. But I, I won't. <laughs> we could do a whole show on that particular novella. It's actually an extended short story. And uh, You'll notice, until I put together the slides for this presentation, I did not realize whom Waugh was caricaturing in one of his drawings. Turned out it was Winston Churchill and Clement Attlee. The, the drawings are hilarious. I put them side by side on a slide so you can see them. But now, so the, and, and, and this is our, we're coming to our conclusion finally. Uh, Love Among the Ruins is a hilarious. It's got a bearded ballerina. It's got everything. It's got a pyromaniac who murders thousands of people and, of course, is rewarded. Uh, but there were so many Fabians in Parliament that the wife, Zena Parker, who was the wife of a Fabian, John Parker, who had a very long and distinguished career in, in Parliament, said it looks like an enormous Fabian school which I thought, in other words, so you're admitting that the Fabians took over the government. And if you go to the Fabian Society website, that is their triumph. In other words, so if we had believed that the Fabian program, if instituted, could bring about a virtual utopia, you see utopia today. And that's what we have. Or if you believe evil and wall, what we have is love among the ruins, except I don't see too much love going on right now. <laughs> and that leads us up to GK. <laughs> yeah, next week, we will go into GK Chesterton and the what is, in my opinion, the result of his interaction and conflict with the Fabians. Now, I warn people, this is my opinion. and. I could almost say with dead certainty that most Chestertonians and distributors will disagree with it. I speak without official sanction. <laughs> Looking forward to that. Michael, appreciate it as always. Okay. Had fun as always. <laughs>